All right, let's see if we can get the clicker working on. Well, good morning again, and uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's kind of cool that guys get baby leave now. Isn't that great? I never heard of that before. We have another grandchild in the way we're excited about. Uh, my son's in the Air Force, and uh, he's going to get three months. Isn't that right? Three months of baby leave? I'm like, wow. That... Uh, Encourages it. Anyway, <laughs> I thought I would share with you a little bit about uh, where I just came back. I just got back from Argentina. And there we go. Uh, for those of you who are geographically challenged, that's Argentina. And uh, I was in the area of what's called Entre Rios right up here in a little town of Concordia. And if you know secret Christian words, Concordia means Germans and Lutherans. Okay? That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> Thank you. That was polite. That was good. It's like, I'll just tell you when to laugh. You know, it's kind of like laugh, applause. All right. Uh, another one of those secret words is Westminster. What does that mean? Presbyterian. Okay, so if you hear Concordia or Westminster, it's sort of code word for Lutheran and, and uh, Presbyterian. Uh, the second week I was down in uh, Buenos Aires, they're teaching at uh, IBA, which is Institutio Biblico Buenos Aires, a seminary that's celebrating its 100th year in the city of Buenos Aires. So I thought I'd just show you a couple pictures here as an introduction. Uh, the class up in the Concordia Center was an extension of this seminary that met up there. Uh, there I am. Uh, some of us were in my Sunday school class this morning will recognize that, that uh, graphic up there uh, was teaching the book of Philippians. So I've been doing that uh, for the last two weeks, and now I'm starting the class here. Um, it was a great group, as you can see. Uh, it was a nice modern classroom and all filled with happy students until I told them about the exam. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, it was a great group, had a great time there. Um, There's kind of a shot of everybody together. Um, I'm going to resist the temptation to point it, say, you know, this is Bob and that's Joe, you know, so. You know, missionary slides go. Um, these next shots are from uh, the school in Buenos Aires. Um, that was a hybrid class. We had about 14 students in person in a, kind of a smaller classroom, but another 35 or so who were taking it online at the same time. So, so far I've gotten like 43 exams in from this group. I'm going to be grading for the next three weeks. So uh, there we that. Um, I also had an opportunity to preach. Uh, I, this is my fourth weekend in a row of preaching. Um, this is in a church uh, that had a night service. There's a really excellent translator, Alejandro, next to me there, and uh, was there speaking. And this is my translator, Daniela in the church I preached at last Sunday, which was really uh, one of the great blessings of my trip. It was the last thing I did on my trip. And then after we were done with this service, uh, they took me to the airport and I flew home. But I thought I would play a little clip. This is a very international church in Buenos Aires. There were Ecuadorians there, Colombians, Peruvians, uh, Paraguayans. I think that's the way you say it or a pair of lions. But anyway, um, that was also supposed to be a joke. <laughs> pair of lions, Paraguayans. <sighs> okay, anyway, uh, but I thought, here's a, here's a group of Ecuadorian ladies singing uh, uh, more of a ethnic music uh, in their native costumes. We'll see if the, hopefully the audio will come through on this.
Okay, there we go. Uh, for those of you who don't know, they are speaking in the Quechua language, which is the uh, language of the ancient Incas and uh, the indigenous peoples that live mostly nowadays in the highlands and some of the more remote areas in Peru, Ecuador, and so forth. So it was, a, it was really one of the highlights of my time. I got a chance to, to preach to this group, and Daniela was an excellent translator, and just really was wonderful. It was the pastor's birthday that day, and so they had a big feast uh, after church in the area there and brought out a big, huge cake. So I left filled up. So, all right, <clears throat> so that's just a little bit of a, I thought I would let you know what I've been up to and where I go when I disappear from church. So um, hopefully it's not, you know, falling away from grace or anything like that. But um, it's been a, it was a fun trip. This is one of the uh, better trips that I've had. It was a great time. Um, but I wanted to, I actually preached this sermon to that group. So... Uh, if I start speaking in Spanish, you know, well, probably you won't understand. Um, but we're going to talk about having heart trouble. Um, just last night, Karen and I were watching, we love mystery shows. You like mystery shows? You know, murder mysteries, you know. And we, we spend more time looking at these old shows like Murder, She Wrote and stuff like that that and, and so, uh, but we always enjoy, you know, trying to figure out who did it and, and that sort of thing. But we were watching one last night, and uh, it was in a church environment, and they had a scene where they're showing the pastor preaching, which is kind of unusual in television, right? You know, you know. And, of course, did they get it right? No, they didn't get it right. So in the course of his very brief two-sentence sermon, all that you get of the sermon was... Uh, you have to follow your heart. Okay? Now, I call this Walt Disney theology. Right? Because, it, you know, you, you watch these, you know, shows, whatever they are, and almost inevitably there's that message in there, you got to follow your heart. Right? How many, you've heard that, right? How many of you heard that? This is like a classroom. You got to respond, right? You know, it's like no exam afterwards, though. But. So, um, but, you know, the Bible has something to say about the heart, and that is not a Christian message. Okay? Uh, um, Jeremiah, I think I had to point this to get it to work. Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10. I don't know. Okay. Um, the heart is deceitful more deceitful than all else and desperately sick who can understand it. I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways. Right? So here we have the Bible saying, you don't want to follow your heart. Okay? Look, hear that again. You don't want to follow your heart because your heart is deceitful and it's wicked. So your heart's going to tell you to do things that are against God's commandments, against God's law. And you see this all the time. And it's, it's sad, but it's this message that gets pounded into us uh, ever since we're little children. And, you know, follow your heart. You've got to follow your heart. And I understand that there's some truth to that and that, you know, you might have a dream or some sort of vision for your life, and you could, you could call that following your heart. But oftentimes our heart is telling us to do something that is selfish and defiling. So, this is just not... Okay, all right, it's lagging a little bit. All right, what we want to do then is do a little mini study, and this is very mini, study on what do we mean when we use the word heart. Now, if I were to say to you, my heart is full today, or I love you with all my heart, we're generally speaking about emotions, right? Valentine's Day, what do you see? You know, hearts everywhere. And so more often than not, when we think of the word heart, the emotion is what we're associating with the idea. 
But I want you to see that the Bible sees it differently. Okay? So I think that's where we're going to start first. What does it mean when it says your heart is deceitful and wicked, right? What is it talking about? So we need to see this from a biblical perspective. And it's interesting that both the Old and New Testament are very consistent here on this. So first we see... I know, and then this thing fell off too, so this is the curse of, curse of Andrew up here, technology. All right, uh, Genesis 6, 5, look what it says. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were evil continually. So here we see that the heart is the center of the intellect. All right, now we could talk about the words used and so forth. Uh, and I could go to many, many other examples of this. I'm just going to give you a couple of instances, both Old and New Testament, to kind of paint the picture for you. But here, it's the center of the intellect. So the thoughts of people were bad. All right? Now, it's not just Old Testament. Luke 9, 47, Jesus knowing what they were thinking in their heart. See that? So thinking in the heart is a part of this. So the Old Testament word for heart is leb. It, it literally means fat because the heart was surrounded by a lot of fatty tissue and so forth. And of course, you're probably familiar with the Greek word for heart, which is cardia, from which we get all the kinds of associated words like cardiology, cardiologist, and all of that. So. Um, but the words are used very similar. So we also see them as the center of the will. Okay? Exodus 7.13. This is a very famous passage. I'm sure we all remember it. Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Well, there's that whole series of events in uh, the events leading up to the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt where Pharaoh hardened his own heart or his heart was hardened. But here it's speaking of someone uh, choosing to resist. So it's an action of the will here. And we also see in Matthew 19, Jesus saying to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it's not been this way. Okay. You had hard hearts, and you wanted something. You had made up your, today we say, you made up your mind. But the Bible writers might say, you made up your heart. Say, you made, up, you, you, you made a choice of the will to resist God, and therefore the heart is also where we have the will. Thirdly, the heart is seen as the center of the emotions as well. Here we have the next verse. There we go. Now the other one's going to pop up probably. Genesis 6.6. 6. The Lord was very sorry that he made man on the earth and was grieved in his heart. So you see the heart also expressing strong emotions. 2 Corinthians 2.4. Paul says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears. I'm looking over here because my eyes aren't good enough to see it back there. Hopefully you guys can see it. Not so that you'd be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have for you. So Paul's talking about anguish of heart in writing this difficult letter to the Corinthians. All right, so if we come up with sort of a basic definition of what the Bible's referring to when it talks about the heart, here's what I've got. Okay, The heart is the center of human personality. It's the center of our souls. The thoughts, the emotions, and the will are all wrapped up into one entity. So think of it this way. Think of the heart as the center of who you are. All right? It's where you think. 
It's where you make decisions, and it's where your emotions reside. Now, today, uh, we think a little more literally. We realize that those are all functions of our brains. Or we might use a more uh, philosophical Greek concept, and you do find this in the Bible as well, the mind. Right? So we know that in our minds is where emotions are, and it all stems from the brain and so forth. But again, it's, it's quite common for languages to and peoples to associate certain functions with parts of the body. Uh, we're talking about uh, Philippians, and Paul was talking about having deep affection for the Philippians, and the word there in Greek is splagna. Like, ooh. Splagna. That doesn't sound good. Yeah, it's it's the the word for the intestines. But the intestines were where the strongest intensive emotions were seen to lie. Today we we associate the intestines with fortitude, right? Or courage. That guy's got guts, right? Well, we all have guts. Some of us have bigger guts than others, but anyway. All right, so um, now this is a very basic thing, but again, I could have taken you to probably another 15, 20 verses on each of those points to give you examples of the context and the way the Bible uses the term heart. So um, where am I going with this? You say this is pretty basic, but this is kind of an analogy sermon, okay? We, we talk about heart trouble today. In this world, it's the number one killer still, I think, uh, heart disease. And so uh, we in our physical bodies have to take care of our hearts, particularly if you are genetically prone to heart disease, right? But what about spiritual heart disease? So here are some preventative measures to stop spiritual heart disease. Now, remember what Jeremiah said. Your heart's sick. You have a spiritual heart disease, whether you like it or not. So I will be your sort of stand-in cardiologist this morning, spiritual cardiologist. Let's, what can we do to deal with our heart disease? Well, the first thing we can do is watch our diet. Okay. I'm not talking about being a vegan here. Vegan, vegan. Anyway, uh, what I'm talking about here is what comes in to our hearts. What is our intake? You know, in our physical bodies, we talk about uh, cutting cholesterol down and, and all these sorts of things and staying away from fatty foods and, and so forth for heart health. But spiritually speaking, and this is one of my favorite verses in all of the Old Testament, Proverbs 4.23. Um, I recommend that you memorize it if you don't have it already. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Now remember, it's not just talking about the motions. It's talking about what we would say the mind today. Watch over what comes in to the gates of your life. Guard it diligently. And we know that there's so much junk out there. There's so much trash. There's so much pornography. There's so much uh, vitriol and angry speech. It's just surrounding us everywhere we look. We need to watch what we allow in to our hearts. And uh, Paul says it in Philippians really well here. He says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence or anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. So here we are watching our diet, watching what do we allow into our hearts. 
If we have nothing but garbage come in, what's going to come out? Garbage. Right? If we play violent video games 10 hours a day, what's going to come out? Violence. So watch over your heart with all diligence. Okay, so we want to watch our diet. All right? And uh, I think this is a, uh, particularly in the Internet world that we live in, and the younger you are, the more it's a part of your life. I'm old enough to remember the world before Internet, before email. Oh, you're old. Before texting, before cell phones. Right? We're old enough, many of us are old enough to remember that. So, uh, but now we're barraged with crud. The biblical word is scubala. Paul says, in comparison to knowing Christ, everything I did before is dung. Scubala. Trash. Refuse. Okay, so. What's the next thing we can do? Avoid stress. <laughs> well, the Bible has some things to say about avoiding stress, right? You know, I mean, we could, I could have expanded this more, but let's just talk about two things that, that cause stress to our hearts. First of all, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> That sounds like a song, right? <laughs> Don't worry. Be happy. Um, but, you know, there was this guy named Jesus, right? And he talked about worry, anxiety. Remember that? We just went through the Sermon on the Mount. This is right out of there, right? Do not be anxious then, saying, okay? What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we clothe ourselves with? Worry. Are you, all the things we worry about. We worry about having enough money. We're worried about, you know, having groceries. We're worried about clothing. Uh, maybe in modern world today, we're worried about the next car. Or we're worried about a nicer house. We're all worried about money things. For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows you need things. Right? He knows you need a house, a home, a roof over your head. He knows you need clothing. He knows you need food. But we fret and then we worry about these things all the time. But what does he say? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Okay? Therefore, don't be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day's got enough trouble of its own, right? So don't worry about tomorrow. Learn to live in the moment. Learn to deal with that stress. And you know, this you know, some people are more anxious about the future than others, and you know who you are. You have a really hard time trusting God that he really does care for you and that you'll be okay tomorrow. Right? But if we worry about these things, it brings stress on us and it brings stress on our Christian life as well. We also have to maintain a clear conscience, and I've got several verses on this, because one thing that really brings stress into the believer's life is guilt. Amen? Yes, guilt. I love it. No, we don't love it. And uh, guilt will bring stress into your life. So, you know, it's very important that we have a clear conscience. So here's some verses. 2 Corinthians 1.12, for our proud confidence is this. This is Paul writing. The testimony of our conscience that in uh, holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we've conducted ourselves in the world and especially towards you. Paul says, as I look back, what I did, I did it for the right motives and I can have a clear conscience. Right? This is important that we live and be people of integrity. 
1 Timothy 1.5 says, But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Okay. A good conscience is part of that stress. You know, there's nothing more stressful than being a hypocrite. Right? I feel it sometimes. I, some, you know, when you're a preacher and a teacher and you look at what you're saying and you go, Oh, man, I'm not there yet. Most of the time I'm there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes you have to teach stuff and you realize, Lord, forgive me, I'm, I don't know that I'm, I'm completely there yet on this principle. Okay. Negatively speaking, 1 Timothy uh, 1, 18 and 19, This I command you earnestly, my son, in accordance with the prophecies, previously made concerning you that you fight the good fight. This is positive. The next one's a negative. Keeping faith in a good conscience. You know, I hear people talking about fighting a good fight. It's usually in a football team. Right? Fight, we're fighting a good fight. You know, the good fight that Paul's talking about is living your life for the Lord through faith and a good conscience. See? Maintaining a clean conscience before the Lord. Negatively, Paul talks about, uh, in 1 Timothy 4.2, the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith. What are they doing? Paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their conscience as with a branding iron. Here's kind of, this is kind of scary. Did you know you can sear your conscience? You know what? You wonder how can people do some of the things that they do? Well, it's probably because they did a bunch of stuff and didn't deal with it, didn't do what we're going to talk about next. They let it fester within them, and then they had to do something else, and they did something else. The next thing you know, they're committing mass murder or something. It just doesn't happen like that. People begin to sear their consciences. And the idea here is, you know, if somebody's hit with a branding iron, what does it do? It, it kills the nerves, right? You get a bunch of scar tissue, and, you, you know, you can't feel anymore. So a seared conscience is someone who probably felt guilty the first time, first few times they did something, but now doesn't bother them anymore. Say, boy, you don't want to get there. That's bad, bad news. And finally, how do we deal with these sorts of things? The Bible is very simple about it. And we could have a whole sermon on this, but we confess our sins. Okay? He's faithful if we confess our sins to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So how do you deal with the stress of guilt, hypocrisy, um, Lack of integrity in your own heart. The first step is repentance and confession. Right? Live, begin to learn to live your life with a clear conscience. And that will avoid that stress. That stress of hypocrisy. That stress of not being genuine before people and so forth. So, avoid stress, right? Develop an exercise routine. Some of you are like, I know where he's going with this one. Okay? First Timothy chapter 4. Paul says to Timothy, Seven and eight, yeah, okay. But have nothing to do with worldly fables fit for only old women, but on the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily dis discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This is Paul telling Timothy. He says, Timothy, maintain your spiritual workout. Right? Discipline yourself to godliness. I mean, we love sports in our culture, right? You know, eagle eagles, right? 4-0 today. No Eagles fans here? 
Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. There we go. All right. Uh, and it's incredible what these athletes discipline themselves to be able to do, right? It's just amazing. And, but Paul is saying spiritual discipline is important too. Okay. And it has value both for this present life and the life to come. Another chapter where he talks about this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. And everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we, an imperishable. Therefore I run in such a way not as without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I buffet my body. By the way, it doesn't say I buffet my body. I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly after I've preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul says, I maintain a spiritual workout. Okay? I discipline my body. Make it my slave. As opposed to being a slave to my own passions, a slave to my own desires. In this world today, people are so naive. They go, oh, you know, explore all this stuff, try all this stuff, right? It's dangerous. Leads to habits, it leads to corruption. And right now, what we have going on in the world today is a, a, a terrible opioid crisis. You know, and it's, it's touched our family. I don't have time to tell this whole story, but my daughter-in-law's stepsister died of a drug overdose a little over a year ago. Right after her husband died of a drug overdose, right after she had a little baby. We're so naive sometimes. We think we can play around with drugs. We think we can play around with pornography. We think we can play around with uh, extra marital sex. We think we can do all of these things and not be impacted by it, but we're wrong there, you see. Paul knew that. He didn't want to be disqualified. I don't want to be disqualified. That's one of my greatest fears, that somehow... I will do something and be set on the shelf and no longer be useful to the Lord. You know. Okay. Let's move on. You may need a heart transplant. Okay. The Lord made this promise to his people in Ezekiel 36. See, maybe you don't know the Lord. Maybe you don't have what Ezekiel's talking about here. But listen to what he says. God's talking to his rebellious people. He says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you'll be clean. I will cleanse you from your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You might be here and maybe you don't know the Lord. Or maybe you just think I'm in church so I'm a Christian. Well, you know, you can stand in a garage and it doesn't make you a car. Right? So you think, well, I'm, you know, I guess I'm a Christian or whatever. You know, I used to think that too. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. But I remember having to fill out paperwork at school. It said religion, and I said, "Well, I'm not Jewish. You know, I'm not a Roman Catholic, so I guess I'm, I guess I'm Protestant." And that's and so what I wrote down. And I, I didn't know the Lord. You see, if you don't know the Lord, you need a heart transplant. See, you need a, the Lord to put His Spirit within you to give you a, a soft heart towards God. And if that's true, you want to cry out like David in Psalm 51. 
Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions. You know, we know our transgressions deep down inside. We make excuses about them all the time. We don't want to hear it, but deep down inside, you know your transgressions. And your sin is ever before you. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. And here's the key here. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. See, if you do not know Christ you only heard about him and not entered into that living relationship with him, you need a heart transplant. See? Remember what we said at the beginning, our hearts are desperately sick. So if you don't know the Lord, you need that transplant. Those of us who know the Lord have this new heart. We just need to learn how to protect it. Turn away from your idols of money, pleasure, and fame, and whatever, and reach out to Jesus who will grant you that peace of heart. And there you'll find rest and forgiveness. For believers, I want some, in honor of Bill, takeaways. Okay, I like, I like, I've always liked that, takeaways. We need to watch our spiritual diet, what we need, what we intake into our hearts and minds. Remember what Paul said? Whatever's good, whatever is excellent, whatever is worthy of praise. You know, so much time we spend looking at junk. Okay? We need to avoid stress, dealing with anxiety, dealing with unconfessed sin that's wearing on our consciences. Learn to be a person, a man or a woman of integrity. Get spiritual exercise. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Develop a regular time of prayer and Bible study. Get involved in ministry in the church. Reach out to some people in need. In other words, get, you know, get spiritual exercise going. You know, meditate. Learn God's word. If we do these things, we'll ensure our hearts are in great shape. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your death on the cross that provided us this heart transplant that we so desperately need. And Father, we, we just ask that as we celebrate and remember your death on the cross, that you will bless this time. And as Steve comes up to lead us, in Jesus' name, amen.